Yo, how's it going everyone? I'm Prospect Z, and I'm so excited to be bringing you guys another Dinkum video. This is a game that I've truly fallen in love with and have been having a blast playing. I'm bringing you guys the Ultimate Advanced Beginner's Guide as a follow-up to the Ultimate Beginner's Guide that I have released already. If you haven't seen that and you are a new player to Dinkum, I highly recommend watching that first as it covers the basics of the game as well as certain mechanics that I won't be covering in today's video. You can find that video up in the upper right hand corner. This video will greatly help improve your Dinkum skills and I will be giving you guys tons of advanced tips as well as things I wish I knew hours earlier. So without any further ado, let's hop right into it. Many of you may be progressing throughout the game and realize that the inventory system could be much better. And you are 100% right. But thankfully, unlike a game like Minecraft, the devs know this as well. This is why they created a way for you to expand your inventory space. Doing this is extremely simple. All you have to do is go to Fletch and look at the cargo license, which expands your inventory or pockets in the game by three slots. You can upgrade this license three times, with the first level being 3,500 permit points, the next being 2,000, and the final level being 6,000. You also see underneath the cargo license is the tool belt license. This will expand your hot bar slot by one for each level. Level one being 250, level two being 1,000, and level three being 3,000 permit points. Now that our inventory has been expanded, this will allow us to carry more items, which in turn will allow us to go further from our base. But with the constant exploring, you may find that your items keep getting damaged and breaking. However, a key tip that I have is to save all of these tools right before they break, as you can purchase a license that will allow you to upgrade these base tools into stronger tools later on. As you increase your mining, logging, fishing, hunting, and farming skills, you will start to receive mail in your mailbox outside your tent from Fletch saying something along the lines of, you've been working hard and I'll tell you what, it hasn't gone unnoticed. Because you've been increasing your skill, there is a new level of a certain license available to you. This unlocks the next tier of the license for purchase. If you purchase the Mining 2 license for 1,000 permit points, you can then take the almost broken basic pickaxe that you bought from John to the crafting table, and by using only two copper bars, you can upgrade the pickaxe to the next level. You can see here the basic pickaxe and the copper pickaxe compared side by side. The copper pickaxe does more damage to the ore requiring fewer swings, which in turn requires less stamina. The same can be said with all the tools. Ever wondering how to obtain hardwood? You'll need a copper axe to cut these down. Once you upgrade your tools, still be sure not to let them break. There is a character named Franklin who is an inventor. Your first time meeting him, he will mention that he will buy these shiny discs. He may be able to extract data from them as well as pay you for them. He uses these discs to unlock new recipes for tech that can help you progress throughout the game or simply just make your life easier. One of the recipes I unlocked from Franklin was the repair table. Bringing all the required items and pay the 60,000 dink, Franklin will then deliver the repair table to you the next day at your mailbox. But you will also have to purchase a repair kit from Franklin as well. This can be found on the back table here. The repair kit will repair all the tools that you have inside your inventory. Inside my inventory, I have loads of tools that are on the verge of breaking, but by going to the repair station and using the repair kit all of my tools become repaired instantly so hang on to all of your tools upgrading your tools to the different level like copper and iron can start to become very resource heavy you will find yourself looking further away from your base for tin and copper ore the ores that spawn naturally will slowly or rapidly depending on how you go about gathering these materials run out instead of wasting time running around hoping to get lucky with finding a copper ore or waiting for new ore deposits to respawn you can instead build a deep mine that allows you to go underground to find new ores down inside the deep mine you also find iron ore the iron ore is going to be crucial to some of the items that will be crafted and used throughout today's video in order to unlock the deed for the deep mine, you'll have to purchase the deep mining license from Fletch for 3,500 permit points. You then have to ensure that all the town debt is paid off in order to apply for the mining deed. Applying for the deep mine deed will cost your town 250,000 dink and will require 10 bags of cement, 10 old gears, 1 old contraption, 2 old keys, 5 tin bars, and 5 copper bars to start construction. You also need a mine pass which can be bought from John for 25,000 dink. Keep in mind that this pass can only be used once, so to make multiple mining trips you will need to purchase multiple passes. 
Before you set out, make sure that you bring with at least two copper pickaxes the first time you go down. The copper pickaxes are going to be crucial to mining the iron ore, as the basic pickaxe isn't strong enough to break it. When going down into the mine, I recommend also bringing down a few of these old keys you will find down with you. You will see that while exploring down in the mine, you will find these weird looking circle areas on your map. These have walls that cannot be broken down, so the only way to get inside is with these keys. However, I won't spoil what you will find inside. You will find loads of iron ore as well as copper and tin ore the further away from the elevator you go. The mine isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Well, obviously. So with that being said, the mine is extremely dark. I highly recommend purchasing a torch from John to light up the mine. But darkness isn't the only thing to be found down below. You will run into new enemies that you haven't seen before, like bats and glowing crocodiles. Killing the bats has a chance to drop bat wings, and killing the glowing crocs gives you normal croco meat. You will also run into a potentially familiar enemy, the fire-spitting bush devil. If you haven't picked up on it yet, you may want to bring good weapons as well as lots of food for health down into the mines with you. I recommend bringing food that boosts both health and stamina like you see here. Cooked croco meat is a very good one to bring with you until you are able to unlock the higher quality foods. These higher quality foods can be cooked at the cooking station. Thankfully, if you do end up dying in the mines, it will just take you back to the mine elevator. You will still be down in the mine, so it won't be wasting a mining pass. However, your tools will take some damage as well as your health and stamina will both be extremely low. Once you're done with your mining adventure, remember to bring everything with you once you go back up to the surface. Also, keep in mind that the mine resets every day, so don't think that it'll be the same every time you go back down. While you're down in the mines, you will find all sorts of different ores like tin, copper, and iron. But one ore you may potentially find, although very rare, is ruby. You can see here it is very easy to miss, so keep an eye out. Once you mine the rock around it, it allows you to pick it up. Not like the other ores though. This ore requires you to hold over your head and run back to the mine entrance as indicated on the map by the purple pickaxe. Once you run it all the way back here, you will go inside and throw it down. Once you decide to go back to the surface, take this item with you over to John's goods and throw it on the scale to the right and John will weigh it and offer you a certain amount. As you see here, for this one ruby, John offers me almost 75,000 dink. The second one he offers me about 62,000 dink. You may also find amber chunks while digging around the map for treasure. Bring these to John as well and just like the ruby, throw it on the scale and John will weigh it and offer you a certain amount of dink for how much the item weighs. Oh hey, me again. Just a quick little interruption here. If you guys are enjoying this video so far or are finding it helpful, please be sure to hit that like button as it greatly helps out the channel. And while you're down there, consider hitting that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future Dinkum how-tos and my future Let's Play, where I will be starting a brand new Dinkum Island and taking you guys along for the adventure. Now that we've covered that, let's get right back to the video. Another item that you will find are the shiny rocks. Put these inside a rock crusher, which can be obtained at John's Goods for 10,000 dink, and you have a chance to get a wide range of ores. As you can see here, the rock crusher spits out a bluish green shiny rock. This is called an opal. You can also find opal randomly inside of some rocks while running around like you see here. If we run this item over to John's Goods, you can see he will offer you 15,000 dink. Now, in order to smelt down the newly obtained iron ore that you gathered down in the mine, you can't use any old basic crude furnace. You will require the normal furnace. This can be purchased from John for about 31,000 dink. These furnaces can also be used around a windmill, which we will cover later, to help speed up the smelting process even further. If you're sitting back thinking, okay, that amount of dink required here is insane, you aren't wrong. It is a lot to purchase all of the necessary equipment and tools that are needed for the mining trip and for the furnace. Thankfully, I have a decent way to make dink until you can get down into the mines. Catching fish is nice and all, but the best way that I have found to make dink is to run around killing any of the animals you can. And I know, I know it sounds harsh, and it is, but it truly is the best way to make dink at this stage of the game. Once you have loads of raw meat, be sure to cook it all. I cannot stress this enough, I made the mistake of selling all my raw meat to John, but by cooking the meat, this will increase the price significantly. And by significantly, I mean double. Which for one piece may not seem like a lot, but say we sold John 20 raw meat at 400 dink each, this will lead to 8,000 dink. But the same 20 raw meat, if it were cooked, could have made you 16,000 dink, if you were to have taken the time to just cook it. To help speed up the cooking process, I recommend purchasing a barbecue from John for 34,000 dink, as this will increase the cooking speed. Pair it with the windmill later on, and you will see another drastic speed increase. Cooking items also goes for items that you get from the farm animals as well, like eggs and milk. Be sure to cook up the eggs you get from your chickens, whereas the milk you can obtain from bombats, which require 
require the level two handling license. You will add the milk into the cheese maker to get the highest amount of dink possible. Remember that the better care you take of your animals, the better products they produce, like creamy milk or normal milk, or small eggs and big eggs. You can check the status of your animals by going to your journal, going to the animals tab, and clicking on the animal you want to view the stats for. Each animal requires three basic needs in order to level up. They must be fed daily, edited daily, and have shelter. In my case here, I have five chickens and I will need five bird coops in order for them all five to have shelter. Now that you've finally saved up enough dink to get yourself down into the mine, and after your long mining expedition, the ores are taking forever to smelt inside the furnace. Thankfully, the devs thought of this too. There's a simple way to increase the speed of this, as well as other production devices like the grinder, barbecue, and others. This requires a windmill. Crafting a windmill requires you to have a level two or higher building license. This will cost you 1,000 permit points. To craft a windmill, you will require 2010 sheets, five old gears, five old springs, five iron bars, and two old wheels. After you craft it up, you must place it within the range of your different production devices. This must be within 12 tiles of the device in order for it to take effect. Another part of this game that is more of a hidden is the ability to teleport. Wait, what? Did I just say teleport? I sure did. However, this can only be done at certain points. As you see here, these large radio towers are the points you must go to in order to teleport. But it's not that simple. You must first repair these towers in order to use this function. To repair one tele tower, you will need three boards, two hot cylinders, one shiny disc, eight bright wires, and one slate. The hardest material to find in my experience are the bright wires. By using your metal detector anytime you go exploring, you are sure to find everything you need in a matter of time. So after you have at least two of these towers repaired, you can now use them to fast travel to the other. This makes for a quick and easy way to move around the map without having to run everywhere or use different vehicles. As you see here, you simply run inside one of the tele towers, select the other location you wish to teleport to. These tele towers are an orange tower icon, so they are easy to spot. Once you click on it, you will be teleported to the other tower. While you are out exploring, a character named Ted Sally will appear. For me, Ted appeared near the center of my map. Ted is a hunter who will buy all hunting products at an increased price. Hunting products are all the different meats. So if you are like me, then you know how much of a pain it is to water your plants every single day. Crops are a great way to earn dink and to make better food to take with you down into the mines. But watering the plants takes so long. As you level up your farming license, you will unlock a better watering can that makes this exponentially easier on you. The level two farming license unlocks the copper watering can which is simply crafted using the basic watering can that you purchase from Rain, as well as two copper bars. The level three farming license unlocks the iron watering can, which again requires the copper watering can and two iron bars. Each one provides a larger area to water plants. The copper watering can adds two tiles to the side for a total of three tiles being watered at once, while the iron watering can adds three additional tiles, totaling six tiles that are watered at once. But watering plants manually is a thing of the past thanks to sprinklers. Once you purchase the level 3 farming license from Fletch, this unlocks a new permit that can be purchased. The irrigation permit. Level 1 is 1,000 permit points, and this unlocks the copper sprinkler, as well as the water tank. Water tanks have a range of 10 tiles, so wherever you place it down at, it will reach all sprinklers within a 10 tile area. Keep in mind that while counting out this area, you must start with the tile that the actual object is on. So underneath the watering tank here is 1, then you count out 10. The basic sprinkler may seem pointless, and to be honest, it kinda is. It's the next level of sprinkler that really allows you to create an amazing farm. Keep an eye out for another video coming soon on the ideal farm layout and how to set it up yourself. Subscribe so you don't miss out on that, as well as other Dinkum how-to videos. Now, I mentioned the upgraded sprinkler, or the advanced sprinkler. To unlock this item, you must first have the Irrigation 2 license. You will then need a regular sprinkler, five iron bars, four old gears, four old springs, and one hot cylinder. The advanced sprinkler can reach two tiles out around it. The basic sprinkler can only water a 3x3 three three area, minus the middle which gives a maximum of eight tiles, while the advanced sprinkler can water a 5x5 five five area, and when subtracting out the middle tile, we get a maximum of 24 tiles. That is a significant upgrade. This is why I said the basic sprinkler is sorta of pointless. It could be used if you want to craft up a large amount of these, but you will need these to get the advanced sprinklers anyways, so making a few may be ideal. Just don't waste more materials than you need in order to craft these up. While on the topic of farming, you may find while progressing through the different licenses, you unlock the composter. You can craft the composter with eight hardwood planks, 
three copper bars, one tin sheet, and 15 nails. The obvious items to add to the composter is obviously root poop, but there are loads of other items that you can add that will create fertilizer as well. A few examples are eight bones, different shells, four root poo, or two vompat poo. The different items that you add will have different time requirements for how long it actually takes to create the fertilizer. The bones will take one day, where the shells will take two days. I will leave a link to the Dinkum Wiki down in the description down below. This will give you all the different items that can be used to create fertilizer, as well as the time required to create it. Fertilizer is obviously used for crops. However, you will see here, while trying to add it to the crop, it is already planted, it will not place it down. You must first place the fertilizer before planting the crop, like you see in this clip. So what exactly are the benefits to using fertilizer? It will speed up the growth rate of the plants. We will use wheat as our first example. On the left, we have a base growth rate without fertilizer. If we planted the wheat on Sunday the 1st, you'll see that the crop will be fully grown by Monday the 9th, so a little over a week to produce the crop. Whereas on the right side, this is the growth rate with the fertilizer being used. If we plant the wheat on the same day as the first example, Sunday the 1st, it will only take until Friday the 6th to be fully grown and ready to harvest. This allows you to grow even more crops in a certain time span. Instead of harvesting four times a month, you can harvest six times a month. Let's use corn as our second example, as corn produces products over a duration of time and can get a little bit more complicated. Again, on the left, you can see that we have the base growth rate without fertilizer. Planting on Sunday the 1st, it will take until Wednesday the 11th to be fully grown and ready to harvest, where on the right, you will see the growth rate when using fertilizer. The first crop will be fully ready to harvest on Sunday the 8th, but since corn continues to produce corn throughout the season, it does not help the corn to produce any faster. So what does this mean exactly? It is only to get the corn plant fully grown. Comparing the two sides, it takes both with and without the fertilizer five days to produce corn again. I hope that you guys were able to learn something from this video, and if you have any ideas on Dinkum content that you would like to see, be sure to leave that down in the comment section down below. And while you're down there, you might as well hit that like button. You may even consider hitting that subscribe button so you don't miss out on a future Dinkum Let's Play series that I will be releasing here soon. Thank you so much all for watching. I've been Prospect Z, and I will see you all next time.